Hi, and welcome to another GCSE History Revision video. In this video, our focus is going to be Paper 1, the Medicine Paper, and the topic will be the Medical Renaissance in England from about 1500 to 1700. Let's start with the key information that you need to know for this period. During the Medical Renaissance, some ideas about disease began to change but the way that doctors treated and prevented disease hardly changed at all. There were key factors that had an impact on this period. Firstly, there were changes in attitude. One was humanism, which was a set of beliefs that included rejecting religious ideas and using science and experiments to answer questions about the world. Another was secularism. This was the idea that religion should be kept separate from other aspects of life. This led to the church to gradually lose its control over education and medicine. There were developments in technology. Some examples were clocks, microscopes and thermometers. And all of these made it much easier to experiment. Education also developed. Some people could afford education for the first time and new universities opened like Padua in Italy and Cambridge in England. Many of these universities encouraged their students to experiment and more experiments were made as a result. Communication also improved. The printing press, which had been developed in 1440, meant that it was now much quicker to make books and much cheaper to buy them. The printing press ended the church's control over book production and its control over ideas. And it allowed for scientific journals to be made to spread scientific ideas and medical ideas. Let's look at the Royal Society. This was a scientific society set up in 1660. It was important because it had a royal charter. This was a document from the monarch, Charles II, giving permission and support. And it gave the Royal Society credibility and raised its profile. And it meant that more people sent their work in to be published or supported the society by donating money. It had its own laboratory full of equipment like microscopes. And this allowed members to do their own experiments or to confirm the findings of other research. And an example of this is that microscopes from the Royal Society was used to confirm Van Leeuwenhoek's discovery of animalcules in 1683. It had its own journal known as the Philosophical Transactions and this was the world's first scientific journal. And it was an important place for scientists to share their work and it helped to contribute to the spread of medical ideas. All the reports were written in plain English and not Latin. This was essential because it made the work accessible for everyone so scientists across Europe could read each other's research and share ideas. And finally, it had a reference library. The society requested that all members provide a copy of any of the work they submitted and then this would be put in the reference library and made available for everybody to read and study if they wanted to. Let's look at the ideas of disease, the different treatments and the preventions used during the Renaissance period. The first one we're going to look at is God and sin. Now this was the idea that disease was seen as a punishment from God or a test of faith. Now this was an idea that had been taught by the church throughout the medieval period and still taught in the Renaissance period. But by the end of this period, most people recognised that God did not send disease. However, during epidemics of disease like the plague, people were so frightened that they did believe that God had sent it as a punishment. There were some treatments associated with God and sin. They included praying, fasting and avoiding sin. However, one key change was that Catholic practices were no longer being used, such as pilgrimages and relics, and that's because by this point, England was a, was a Protestant country. 
Some people, however, still believed in the king's touch, for example, with the disease scrofula. There were preventions associated with God and sin as well. Again, they refer to prayers, avoiding sin, and even repentance, which was showing God that you were sorry for your sins. But again, as you can see, there were no flagellants because this was a Catholic practice, no longer used in Protestant England. The second idea we're going to look at is the four humours theory. Now this was the belief that unbalanced humours cause disease. Now by this end of this period most physicians stopped believing in unbalanced humours and in fact it was completely disproved by 1700. But ordinary people still followed it and they expected their physicians to use it when they went to see them. Many people believed that people were born with either a strong or a weak constitution, meaning that some people were more likely to get unwell than others. There were many treatments still being used associated with the four humours theory. That included purging. However, new chemical treatments were being used, such as antimony, which could be used in small doses to make the patient sweat, or a large dose to make them vomit. Bloodletting was still being used as well, and this is because many people expected their physicians to use this treatment. And the same with herbal remedies and theriacs. There were many preventions still being used. There was one new idea of having a balanced lifestyle. This meant stopping yourself from getting unwell by avoiding getting cold drafts, or drinking strong alcohol, or eating rich or fatty foods. Miasma. Now, this was the idea that bad air or smells created by rotting matter could make you unwell. Now, this was still widely believed during this period. And it was especially popular during epidemics of disease like the Great Plague. So there were many preventions associated with this. So hygiene was seen as being important. Um, but public bathing had actually stopped because it was associated with a particularly nasty sexually transmitted disease called syphilis. So instead, people tried to keep themselves clean by rubbing themselves with linen and changing their clothes as often as possible. Some people still use regimen sanitatis if they could afford a set of instructions to be written by their physician. And many people just try to keep their cl homes clean by hanging sweet herbs or using pomodeurs and even trying to keep uh, streets clean or moving away from an area that they thought was smelly and was causing illness. The final one is a new idea that emerged from this period and it was called contagion. And it was the belief that diseases were caused by seeds in the air. And it also was associated with the belief that certain conditions spread diseases. And this became a lot more popular. Barometers and thermometers were used to measure and record weather conditions. There was only one prevention, and that was to move away from an area with a disease. Let's look at some ideas about the cause of disease that were no longer used in the medical renaissance. The first is astrology. Now that was a medieval idea where some people thought the position of the planet or the stars could affect your health. But this became a lot less popular after AD 1500. Another was digestion. And this again was the idea that diet could cause disease, but people gradually stopped believing in this during the Renaissance period. And there were also some new treatments that appeared during this period. So herbal remedies. Now herbal remedies was an old idea, but some of the herbal remedies being used were different. 
So now some doctors or physicians were matching the colour of the disease to the herb they used. So for example, yellow herbs like saffron were used to cure jaundice. There's also a brand new idea about treatment and that was transference. Now this was the idea that you could transfer the illness into another object. For example, rubbing a wart with an onion, hoping that the wart would transfer into the onion and leave the patient. And you also had some new remedies from the new world. Now, the new world was North and South America. And a really important example that you could learn is the chinchinoa bark from Peru. And this was popularised by a particular doctor called Thomas Sydenham, and he used it to treat malaria. Now let's focus on Sydenham and his ideas about disease and his treatments. But first, on the screen I've put down what medieval doctors did and believed. You may want to pause the video here to just read through them by yourselves. Now Thomas Sydenham was very different to these medieval doctors. In fact, he argued against a lot of the things that they had done previously. So firstly, he did not follow the work of Galen and Hippocrates. And in fact, he believed that the cause of disease came from outside the body, not inside. He refused to rely on medical books when diagnosing illness. In fact, instead, he believed in closely observing the symptoms of his patient and he encouraged others to do the same. He treated the, the disease that caused the symptoms, not each separate symptom. And he also believed that diseases could be classified. And finally, he encouraged doctors to use remedies to treat the disease. Again, not treat the separate symptoms. And he believed the nature of the patient had little to do with disease. So again, he wouldn't have believed that your constitution would have affected you. Um, and he, he helped to set up the foundation of a more scientific approach to medicine. And that's why it's really important you know as much as you possibly can about this particular doctor and his methods. So if you need to, pause the video here to read over it and make sure you understand. Let's look at the medical care and healers available during the Renaissance period. Firstly, you had physicians. Now, these were university educated healers and they would have been incredibly expensive. Most were still trained using books and not practicals. However, universities now offered dissection as this was legal and much more fashionable. But it be, could be quite hard to get hold of bodies for dissections. Physicians on the whole had more access to printed books, meaning they often were much more knowledgeable. You also had apothecaries. Now these were people who mixed remedies. They were much cheaper than physicians, so most people when they were poorly would go and see an apothecary. They had new chemical ingredients from all over the world, including the new world. And an apothecary had to have a license. There were also surgeons or barber surgeons. These were people who did simple operations like bloodletting. Again, they were cheaper than physicians and they had developed new techniques during the wars of the period. Again, they had to have a license. You had hospitals. Now these were funded by charity and majority of them at by the Renaissance period were no longer run by the church. They actually began to admit infectious patients, not just patients that needed rest. The hospitals would now provide medication and would often have physicians working in them. And you even had a special type of hospital known as pest houses that would admit people who were contagious or had diseases like plague and the pox. And then finally, you had the home. This is where most people would receive medical care. This was often from women in the family. And they would grow herbs and mix their own herbal remedies. 
Many women acted as midwives and some poor women sold remedies in towns. Let's look at our case study, the plague of 1665. London was particularly badly hit. A hundred thousand people died just in London from the plague. There were some new treatments and preventions, but the plague could still not be stopped. There were many ideas about the cause of the plague. The most popular was miasma, or bad smells was its cause. Others believed it was a punishment from God for their sin. There were even some who believed it was to do with the position of the planet, though this was not as popular a theory. And finally, others believed it was a contagion or caused by seeds in the air. There were treatments that we need to know about. Transference was one new treatment that was being used. And in the case of the plague, many people tried to transfer the illness away from their bodies by attaching live chickens to their buboes. Others stuck to more traditional remedies like hermal remedies or trying to make the patient sweat the disease out. There were new remedies known as quack remedies. These were often sold on the street by non-qualified doctors or quack doctors. There were also preventions that we need to know about. Many people tried to pray to keep the disease away. Others tried to keep the miasma away by walking around with posies or pomodors. Others smoked tobacco to clear the air around them. Some towns tried to keep the plague away by setting up quarantines or banning public gatherings like closing down alehouses. Some towns tried to clean the streets in order to remove the miasma. And there were even some people who believed that by catching syphilis first, you would be protected from the plague. Let's do some exam focus now. On the screen is a question. Pause the video and read the question. It is asking us to explain one way in which the treatment of disease and illness was different. And then it has given us two separate centuries, the 14th century and the 17th century. It's going to be really useful for you to know what periods both centuries are referring to. By 14th century, they mean the 1300s, and that was during the medieval period. By 17th century, they mean the 1600s, and that would be referring to the Renaissance. It's going to be very helpful for you to know your centuries your, and your periods and the dates. Here's a model answer. You may want to pause the video to read it. The answer has got four marks, four out of four, because it gives a clear difference and then it gives two very detailed examples from each period or century to support it. Now it's your turn. I've given a template. You may want to pause the video and have a go at writing your own answer to this question. I've also put another question. This time though, it asks you to explain one way in which the prevention of disease and illness was similar in the 14th and 17th century. The technique will be similar, but this time you are focusing on a similarity between these two different periods of medical history. Here is the model answer for this question. Again, you may want to quickly pause to read it. The answer gets full marks, four out of four, because again, it gives a clear similarity and then it supports it with two detailed examples from both periods. Now it's your turn to have a go if you'd like to. I've given you the template you may want to pause the video to have a go. Now let's do a quick knowledge quiz. On the screen are some questions and multiple choice answers. 
you may want to pause the video to have a go to test what you've learned so far. I will reveal the answers on the next slide. Here are the answers to the knowledge quiz. Again, you may want to pause the video to mark and correct your work. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. There are many other videos to watch on the YouTube channel.